Good evening, everyone. Thank you for attending. I'm Steve Suraboff. I'm the vice chair of this chapter of the MIT Enterprise Forum. It's the MIT Enterprise Forum of the Central Coast. I'm also a partner and sponsor of SoCal IP Law Group. We have a terrific program for you tonight, and I'm sure you're going to enjoy it. So to introduce our program, EdTech, Opportunities, Impacts, and Challenges, I want to invite my good friend, Christy Horton, to come and join me at the podium. Welcome, everyone. I'm Christy Horton. I'll be tonight's moderator. As an MIT alum, a professional investor, a business owner, an entrepreneur, a lifelong learner, and of course, a parent, education technology has always been a great passion of mine, particularly the question of how technology can improve the effectiveness of education. I'm sure most of us can agree that much could and should be done to improve education here in the US, and that doing so is key to the future of both our human capital, here in the room, for example, and our nation. To quote just a few statistics, right now, over $1.3 trillion is spent on education here in the US. That's over 9% of the US GDP, and it's the second largest spending area next to healthcare. Yet 60% of our college-bound high school seniors are really not prepared yet for college and have to take remedial classes prior to arriving. In the job market, there are more than 7.6 million unfilled jobs in the US right now. And so employers are struggling to find qualified candidates. Education technology companies are helping to address these issues and more, as we'll hear in a minute. Um, and this has driven the explosive growth that we've seen in EdTech spending and in startup funding. Today, EdTech is one of the world's largest and most active investment areas. And of course, there are opportunities um, abounding for educators, lifelong learners, entrepreneurs, and investors, but there are also challenges. Here to tell us more in our sixth MIT Enterprise Forum on EdTech, we have right here in front, Brian Healy, who's the education sales expert at Education Market Experts. We have Mindy Bingham next to him, founder and president of Academic Innovations and MyTenurePlan.com, and also the, ed the uh, executive steering committee member at Get Focused, Stay Focused, George Tamas next to her, next to her, who is president of LearnX and Interactive Virtual Learning, and Jim Hurley, founder and CEO of Lesson Planet. So now I'd like to turn it over to Brian Healy for an overview of the EdTech landscape. Thank you, Christy. That's great. Can everyone hear me okay? Yep. Cool. Great. Um, good afternoon. Good evening. My name is Brian Healy. I'm the president and managing partner for Education Market Experts. And what we simply do is we help companies build and scale in the K-12 and higher ed education markets, mostly with ed tech companies, also with some publishing companies. Um, before I spent my whole career in the education space building and scaling companies, I was a third grade struggling reader. I couldn't read in third grade. I was sharing this with Jim earlier. Um, I was the six out of seven brothers and uh, all of my oldest brothers were academically very gifted. And this guy came along, and I couldn't read when I got to third grade. And so I had the most amazing third grade teacher. Her name's Betty Anderson. She was a flower child. She had a crazy guitar, and she had flowers all over it, right? Anyone still teaching right now in the classrooms? Yeah? Imagine that. So the very first day of third grade, she pointed at me, she goes, come here, mister, you're going to stay with me at lunch. And so Betty Anderson taught me how to read in third grade. So from that time, the impact that that made on a young boy, third grader, to eventually get back on track, go to high school, finish, I did my undergrad at Cal Poly Slow up here, so any Mustangs in the room? All right, there we go. Uh, and then to graduate school. Um, uh, wound up being president of a couple of different education companies, Hooked on Phonics being one of them. I don't know if anyone remembers that from the 90s. Um, Kinder Music, an early childhood company I built, 
scaled um, and uh, had an exit with that organization. And most recently, I was the head of teacher created materials. So it's one of the largest education technology and publishing companies in the US. Um, jumped into this arena because myself, and these are my partners up here, we felt and we knew there was a bit, very large need from the early stage education technology companies that people were struggling. People didn't know how to navigate the K-12 and higher ed landscape. People were in their closets, in their dorm rooms, right, in their incubators, and they're, they're building these great, amazing ed tech tools, but guess what? They didn't know how to bring them to market, let alone scale in selling into the K-12 and higher ed markets. So in a nutshell, that's what we do. So we have a portfolio of, um, we've, had, we've helped out over 100 companies um, you know, in the past 10 years. Uh, everyone from Apple all the way down to a young person in his dorm room you know, getting started. Most recently, one of our um, early stage companies is called Turnitin. So any of you and college students doing your homework, you guys know Turnitin? So we helped them when they were just getting started. Okay, so, so that's what we do. So Christy and my friend Matt, they asked me to come and talk today just a little bit about some of the trends in EdTech. So most of this is gonna be geared towards the entrepreneurs and investors in the room, but I'll try to connect as much as possible with all of us in the education community because I also was an elementary school teacher for two years in North Carolina, and I realized I could be the worst teacher, I think, on the face of the planet. Uh, but I developed a skill for writing curriculum. So that's how I got started uh, in this space. Okay, um, so these are great folks. We have an office in Irvine. So I'm the president managing partner. It's all out of Irvine. We also have an office in DC and in North Carolina. And so our team is, uh, most of our team have been in the classrooms or uh, most recently, like Dr. Volant, she was the number two at LA Unified. She just retired a year ago. So she's now working for us full time. So we like to have people part of our team that are relevant and they truly know the ins and outs of the K-12 and higher ed marketplace. So question, so whenever you see this, this means let's get engaged, right? So any, by a show of hands, anyone in the room, who has either sold or you had the decision-making ability to purchase something for your school, whether it's preschool all the way through university level of something of over $5,000 in value. All right, we got some hands in the room. Congratulations, it takes a lot to get into that position. Um, so all of you, a lot of this stuff, you're gonna be pretty familiar with, but for the large majority of everyone else, hopefully you gain some value out of this next uh, 15 minutes together. Okay, so the message today, it's gonna be a little bit about the EdTech market overview. What we really try to do is to, we try to help partner and teach with our company, our partner companies, how to bring products to market, how to build your value proposition, and then how to go out and start having discussions with educators. Because it all begins with personal relationships and discussions, and ultimately the, you know, the dirty word that nobody likes to talk about is that means it's selling, right? So that's what we do. We teach and we partner with our companies on how to sell and how to scale your ed tech products across the globe. Not just the US, Jim and I were talking, probably 30% of our business is now in China. So ed tech development, which is happening here in California, you know, it's not just the US market, you gotta be thinking um, globally as well. Okay, so that's uh, today's message. So as we were preparing to, to um, talk today, have this discussion with everyone, this term ed tech is very broad, it's very big. And there's a lot of debate on what is the definition of ed tech? Because when I was a young person with Betty Anderson, she had that crazy guitar with flowers all over it. The, 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 the cool ed tech stuff was, remember the old projectors? And we'd watch the movies in the classroom about World War II, you know, and going through all of the education. That was ed tech. Right, and then that then eventually scaled to, um, uh, we had the overhead projectors, 
And then remember in the late 80s when Apple started coming out with PCs, right? I mean, there, were, there weren't even PCs in classrooms really until the late 80s, early 90s. So in my definition of ed tech is, you know, that was really the launch pad. You know, it was when Apple made the huge push, you know, with their PCs and getting them into classrooms, you know, in that late 80s, early 90s. And then from that point on, my gosh, you know, the definition of ed tech is, it's, it's crazy. But what I'd like to do is just hear from you, just from the, the audience, and feel free, raise your hand and I'll ask you, what do you think the definition of ed tech? So think of products, think of markets. Anyone want to volunteer? Let's think, yes, in the back. Yep. Yeah, so displacing the traditional, you know, uh, for like uh, textbooks, the traditional way of delivering content in a lot of classes, right? So a lot of that's cloud-based, yes. Yep, great, great response. So it's bringing lots of different tools together to try to enhance that personalized learning experience, right? So think of, you know, cloud-based, right? We always hear everything about the cloud, right? How much content now is delivered through the cloud. Think of devices, right? Think of professional development. How do you learn how to become a better educator, right? A lot of it is done through, a lot of that is classified as ed tech, right? So, so for the purposes of you know, kind of what we think about, I know Christy talked a little bit about the market opportunity, uh, but when you look at the global ed tech market opportunity, it's $6 trillion. And we look in the US alone, it's $16 billion this year that's gonna be spent on ed tech products, right? And so those would be everything you can think of, hardware, software, right? Primarily in this ed tech definition. Now the challenge of this is, uh, and by the way, I got a lot of this data from um, the US Department of Ed, um, and the Software Information Industry Association, which is kind of the governing body for ed tech in the US. Um, so when you look at this, inv this, this dollar amount, that's a big dollar amount, $16 billion. Just this year, that's what's gonna be spent. When we look into the future, there are some analysts that predict in the US alone that 16 billion is gonna double in five years. I wouldn't plan on that. I would probably say it's probably gonna be pushing to $20 billion, but any way you slice it, it's a big market. The other way to look at the market size in the education landscape is what is the FTE is full-time equivalent expenditures per student. So right now in the US, for every single student in high school that's here at Bishop Diego, right? Garcia Diego? For each of you, it's about $12,800, right, in terms of funding that's spent for every single child in K-12 in America today, right? This is, this is a national average. Compared to a lot of the other 36 developed countries are about $9,500. So we're investing about 35% more in our K-12 students on a per capita basis than, you know, the, the, whoa, the other 36, <laughs> um, countries uh, as a benchmark. And for all, all the um, young professionals that are in post-secondary, that's what the investment level is, $31,000. And you look at what the other countries are, we're nearly double what we're investing in all of our college kids compared to you know, the rest of the world. So you, when you look at the two markets, K-12 and higher ed, they're ripe. There's a lot of dollars there. The dollars are flowing. We're not anticipating the dollars to be cut off, um, at least in the next few years. Um, one of the things, though, that I want to caution everyone, that we caution all of our clients, is 85% of these dollars are not spent on products or curriculum, right? 85% are invested. They cover operations, 
right? They cover infrastructure, they cover salaries for all of our amazing, wonderful educators across the US, okay? So as people are looking at well, what's the global market for, or what's the education market for ed tech, if you look at these whole numbers, it could be misleading. Roughly 15% of those numbers are designed for buying products and services that come from us, the vendor community, into the education market. That makes sense for everyone? Yep, okay. Okay, so we're gonna talk a little bit about some of the deals. So this last year was the largest year on record for investment dollars um, buying ed tech companies. So it was almost $1.5 billion last year of deals that were invested in early stage ed tech companies. So it's a very healthy market right now. But what you'll notice is the, the second prior year was 2015. Um, 2018, it was a little bit higher. 2019 is on a uh, similar trajectory, but the deal flow is happening. The, the, the only issue is, is the deal flow, let me go back one, we're seeing fewer deals, but larger investments in 2018 compared to 2015, okay? Here's some of the markets. So when you look at some of these lines, the, the investment percentages in K-12 versus higher ed were pretty similar, right? It was, it was almost 50-50. But specifically, when you look at, well, how much is invested in curriculum ed tech offerings? You can see last year it was, what, about $600 million, right? Or excuse me, the green line, about $350 million. Then teacher needs, so that's mostly professional development companies less than $100 million were invested in early stage ed tech companies. And then we have school operations and then post-secondary, that's the university higher ed numbers. So these are some of the different categories that are pretty hot, that is, that is attracting investment dollars if you're an early stage ed tech company. So China. So these are some of the biggest ed tech investments that happened last year in the US is on the left. These are the company, and this is how much they raised. You can see on the right, these top, one, two, three, four, five, six, top six are all in China. So this is one of my clients right here, VIP Kid. They're the ones that advertise everywhere. They're the ones that are advertising, hey, teach your US kids Mandarin. And we do it all over the internet. So there's live people in Beijing that are working crazy hours at night tutoring through Zoom all of our US kids on how to learn Mandarin. So they raised $500 million last year. So you can imagine. So this is just a little thirst. When you look at these top four Chinese companies, when you look at how much money they raised, those top four raised more than all of the US alone in 2018. So when we think of ed tech, we always think of the US market, and that's great. but. Moving to um, the international markets is, is a real consideration. Uh, these are some of the largest investors. So a lot of you that are in private equity and um, uh, in the investment side, you know a lot of these companies. So these are some of the, the number of ed tech deals they did last year and some of the dollar amounts. So a question, should you consider working for an ed tech company? Should you invest in an ed tech company? If you're an educator, should you buy from an early stage ed tech company? All legitimate questions, right? The biggest thing that um, we work with our clients is talking about the hurdles. So the biggest reason why between 80 and 90% of early education companies fail Okay, so for all of you entrepreneurs out there, two out of every 10 make it in starting ed tech companies. Eight out of 10 don't. That's the history, that's where we're at. If you wanna to try to be part of the two that make it, these are the things you really gotta consider. Because making great content, making great platforms, making great products, that's the holy grail it is. But the next set of the equation, how do you bring it to market? How do you scale the business? How do you sell to schools? That's where most people fall short. 
So these are some of the top hurdles. They're so slow sales cycle. It can take up to two or three years for a school system to say, okay, we're ready to finally buy something from you. And that's, you run out of cash at times, right? You can't sustain. Decentralized decision makings, right? Lots of districts have lots of people involved in these decisions. Lots of universities and higher education institutions, they have lots of people involved. So it, it's, it, it, it takes time to get everyone on, on, on board. Risk um, aversity to new companies. So one of the first thing that our, all of our education decision makers will say is, okay, who are you? How long have you been around? Show me your research that this works. I wanna see efficacy, and I wanna see how this is aligned to all of our standards in Santa Barbara or in Carpinteria, okay? So, so these types of things are really important. And then lastly, unstable funding patterns, right? And you get a lot of changeover in decision makers in, um, in terms of the decision makers within the education space. So being on top of understanding where the funds are coming from and building content and building your business processes to take advantage of where the funds are coming from. It's really important. Um, from the school's perspective, what are their biggest hurdles when looking at buying and adopting new ed tech? These are the top five reasons why schools say, you know what, we're not ready. We don't wanna buy from an early stage ed tech company. It's about how can they sustain it and scale this from one classroom or one school as a test. Let's say they have 100 elementary schools in the district. You know, that's a big leap going from one to 100. So how is that gonna scale? That's the number one concern. Then it's digital equity, right? Our devices, what if kids can't afford the devices? What if the kids can't bring them home? So this digital equity is a big deal. Um, pedagogy, technology, ongoing professional development, and then um, technology and the future of work. So these are the big reasons, if you're an early stage ed company, be prepared to deal with these as primary objections when you're trying to bring your product to the uh, K-12 and higher ed marketplace. This is the ed tech adoption curve. You guys ever seen this before? So these are the early adopter stage, and this will typically take about one to three years. Then you'll move into the kind of, you'll move into the the pragmatist stage here, that's where you start to scale. And then this is where, this is where it gets fun, right, in, in, this, in this area. T to model that, this is, the, this is the sales model. So in the early stage of most ed tech companies, when you look at how do they sell this to schools, it's a very highly relational, very high cost sales model. And this is where most people fail. They, don't, they run out of money. So getting through this early phase, that's the most challenging part. But if you can get to the volume phase, this is where, this is where you really start changing lives, right? And that's, and that's being in this industry, that's what we're in. We're in it for the kids, we're in it for the education. Some of the purchasing cycles um, right now is when all the orders happen, but really when you're looking at selling into the schools, it all starts right here, November through February is gathering info. The schools are researching, and then needs assessment, and then they're starting to make decisions in the spring. So the spring is the prime time. Fall, you're planting seeds. Spring, you're watering those seeds. And then the summer is when you're harvesting. That's the sales cycle. Okay, just a couple other things. Um, sales channel considerations. There's uh, direct sales, there's also indirect sales. Early stage companies, you have to be a direct sales company to get started. You don't want somebody else selling your stuff if they don't know it like you do. That's what it boils down to. Um, alternatives, it's very expensive to build a sales staff. So alternatives for early stage company are these. These education service agencies and school consortia. Right now, so think of these county offices of education are often what they are here in California. So there's 553 of these across the country. They control 80% of the decisions and funds that are spent in ed tech every year. So if you want a very high impact, low cost way to try to bring your product to market, this is a great focus, is focusing on these educational service centers. Yep, just about done. Um, these innovation hubs are another way, because the, the key question is about research. When you go in and you sit down with the decision maker and say, show me the research, this works. A lot of times you don't have time, you don't have money to fund a research project showing efficacy. 
So these are called these iHubs, and there's one here in Santa Barbara. It's not on, on, not on this list, but these are a way to shorten the sales cycle. So working with an iHub is a great alternative to help you with the efficacy part of it. Um, these are the uh, vendor marketplaces. This is another way. This could be a sales channel for you. These are other people selling your products when you get, when you get to time. And then these are some of the review platforms. So kind of the, the uh, holy grail here is this What Works Clearinghouse. So this is having the US Department of Ed review your ed tech product or solution. And if they give it the, the check, the thumbs up, that's what you need to then start approaching your schools and universities. Um, last uh, thing here is a couple of metrics. Some of the return on investment stuff for startups, for every dollar you're um, spending in expense in early stage, typically you get 70 cents in revenue. Okay? That's early stage. Once you get to early stage, for every dollar of expense, you should be expecting $4 in revenue. And then as you mature, you know, you can see best case or for every dollar you're investing in growing your ed tech company, you should be expecting between seven and ten dollars in sales coming back in. Okay, makes sense for everyone. I know I'm last. Um, we think the current opportunity from the investment standpoints in AI. So feel free to track me down afterwards. I can show you some of my thoughts. Um, we think you can see kind of where things are now. This is where we think they're going. So artificial intelligence is real. I have a client right now, I was down there this morning at UC Irvine. It's one-to-one -one teaching early literacy through artificial intelligence. It's amazing stuff. So the key question is, in today's environment, can an early stage ed tech company survive? What do you guys think? Right? If you do the right things, the right planning, Absolutely. Thanks for sharing the time, everyone. Good evening. Uh, my name is Mindy Bingham. I'm the CEO and founder of Academic Innovations, which is a local educational company. And I'm going to share with you in the next 15, 20 minutes uh, a, a history of what this looks like when you've done it for 30 years. We are just entering our 30-year process, as you can see, founded in 1990. We are a mission-oriented publishing company, meaning that our bottom line is basically the success of the students. So let's begin with the end in mind. First, I want to say to Brian, I concur with everything you said there. I mean, it was going, yes, 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 yes. Very, very astute. But I'm going to give you a couple of other things that I've learned from the trenches. As you decide if you're an ed tech entrepreneur, um, decide are you developing a tool or are you developing a complete curriculum? You can do one or the other. Are you going to go it alone or are you going to go it in partnerships? And I don't mean just business partnerships, I mean partnerships with educational entities, organizations, etc. cetera. Um, what will be your key goal? Is it to impact education or is it to impact your bottom line? It needs to be both. What are some of the developmental issues that you're going to look at is you need to build your product based on educational research. Um, if you're an, a technology person and you've got a great idea, step back. Look at the research as it relates to what you're trying to do. But this is very important. Constantly review your data. So once you get started, once you get your programs going, you have to be able to say, does it work? Does it make a difference in student success if it doesn't tweak it? Because if it doesn't do that, you will not stay in the market long. And then last thing, will you be using artificial intelligence or will you be using the brain power of your students? This is a very, very interesting question now. When you see in Silicon Valley some of the ed tech or some of the Silicon Titans questioning the technology in their own students or their own children's schools. So this is something, as you look at artificial intelligence, make sure that you're not taking away the opportunity of the brain power of your students. Um, politics play a key role in education, whether it's the funding at the state and federal level and the politics involved with that and how it comes and goes and comes and goes, or the politics in your local school district with your school boards, or even the politics that actually happen on campus. Those are challenges when you're in the educational um, thing, uh, arena. Is it students first or is it the educational organization first? 
That's a big question. Who is your ultimate purchaser? Is it the administration or the parents, or is it the students? In education, except at the college level, and even then, your professors are telling you what to buy, it's not the end user who's making the decision. But when you design, you have to design with the students in mind. And I'm going to tell you a little bit more about that as we go through this. And then you better be in this for the long haul effort. It is not a short term, it's not a short term buying cycle. It takes you years to get into it. It takes you years to be able to prove what you're doing is right. So you better be able to be into it for the long term. So I'm going to do a quick case study, and I'm going to try to do this very quickly. So ask questions. Um, I won't go into a lot of depth. OK, for 29 years, the key focus of academic innovations has been that every freshman, now it's high school or college, completes a comprehensive guidance course, an actual course, that culminates in a meaningful, skills-based tenure education plan. That's what we do in a nutshell. And creating and maintaining an education plan is now an even longer, lifelong process. This is not something you walk across graduation and you're done. Uh, 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 uh. You know, it's, if you're not a lifelong learner now, you're not going to keep your job. And so helping young people understand that is, is part of our process. For the first 15 years, we were a traditional educational publishing company. Those are some of the books. You see the books over there. And over that time, we've impacted over 2 million students with a course. Those courses are either 90 minutes to 180 minutes long, uh, excuse me, 90 hours to 180 hours long. We're not talking just a tool. We're talking about going into a high school or a secondary school and having them change their bell schedule and everything else to do these courses. That took a long ramp up over those 15 years to get done. What were the outcomes of the schools? We saw increased attendance. We saw higher academic achievement. We saw higher concurrent enrollment rating, uh, rates, which means dual enrollment, advanced placement courses, and higher completion rates, both school, career pathways, and colleges. So we have been able to demonstrate that what we do with a comprehensive guidance course can make that kind of thing. Uh, why does it work? Very simply, when students can project themselves into the future and understand the consequences of their actions today, the research showed, beginning as early as the 1970s and the 1980s, that they were far less likely to drop out of school, use drugs, or become a teen parent. It was the ability to project into the future, understand the consequences of their actions today. Then in 2005, we joined as a partnership, public-private partnership, with George Washington University's Freshman Transition Initiative. We helped with the development of freshman transition standards. At the time, the Bill Gates Foundation was investing a lot of money in this area. There became an awareness and a national conversation that that freshman year, whether it's high school or college, was a very pivotal point, and we needed to pay attention to it, which is music to our years, because for 15 years we've been saying that. Um, it was a publication in the NASSP, which is a National Association of Secondary School Principals, that launched this effort. And at that point, we said, oh, finally technology has reached the point where we could go online and develop a 10-year planning process. Up until then, it was all done paper and pencil, and it was so exciting to be able to do that. And so MyTenurePlan.com was born. Um, this is an intentional hybrid course. Let's go back to research. Research now is showing that hybrid courses actually have more impact on learning than what we call distance learning or completely computerized courses. And so the hybrid course is basically they read and write in their workbooks before going online to the tenure plan to continue this tenure planning process. Technology plays a role, but it's not a panacea. And so as you're developing, continually remember that. Remember, that's really important in your development. Another way that we use technology starting back in 2006 is we started using technology very extensively for online learning and professional development of our instructors. And the reason for that is, as you, you said earlier, you know, what's happening is you have these wonderful products, but if you don't have that continuing ongoing professional development, those products many times are going to fail. They're going to get into the schools and they're going to fail. So this has to be just as important as the development of your product. 
And you can see these are just some of the different um, things we're doing. We have a, a teacher's lounge, very extensive teacher's lounge. We get input for that teacher's lounge from our schools all over the country, the teachers sharing their information. And we also have an online instructor's resource center for our college instructors. If we have a self-directed professor and they, can, they get on this website, they can do a great job at teaching this course at the college level. We don't have to go on and train them because we can't. We're a small company. We don't have the resources to do that. We now have, and again, going back to what Brian said, is when we're looking, this is a whole school program. This doesn't just have a course, and I'll talk about that in a minute. But we now have developed a 10-step plan based on the George Washington University's 10-step plan for our Get Focus, Stay Focus, and I call this the Yellow Brick Road. Any school who wants to launch and implement a school-wide program can go down this Yellow Brick Road and do a really good job instead of having to hire a $100,000 consultant to come in and do it, which most of the schools don't have. So we use technology, again, to, to, to support that process. And in two weeks, drum roll, we will launch our biggest effort, and it's called Academic University, Uni Academic Innovations University, and it basically will be the gold standard. It will be over 75 short videos and online tutorials so that any instructor or administrator can go online and look up different topics and get any very short four, two minutes to 12 minute videos on that. We'll launch it with 75, it'll grow to about 140 within the year. Um, in 2009, this was a big move for us. Santa Barbara City College dual enrollment program came to us and said, we like your course, we want to make this into a dual enrollment course, will you become a partner with us in doing that? And we did that, and we launched the dual enrollment freshman transition initiative with Santa Barbara City College and four local high schools all came on board, the Santa Barbara schools and the Carpinteria schools, and they, they said, we're going to give it a try. And I want to do a shout out right now to the Carpinteria group who's sitting back there. We have Diana Rigby, the superintendent, and Gerardo Canero, who's the principal. And Gerardo is one of your edupreneurs. I mean, he said from the beginning, I'm going to have all my freshmen do this. Every one of my freshmen at my high school, and they've been doing that now for 10 years. And really, we've seen some amazing kinds of data. So looking at your data, in their case, um, they have increased their A to G um, completion rates from 24% to 50%. That's huge. That's huge. I know the University of California was looking at saying, how do we increase it by 2%? They increased it from 24 to 50%. That is a huge increase to do that. And what they mean by A to G completion rate, it means that students are qualified to apply for and be accepted at the U University of California and the state system. You have to be A to G compliant if you're a student. Their performance, their academic performance index went up. Their suspension rates plummeted. And suspension is a big measure of completion and su student success. Because if students are not in class, they can't succeed. Here's some statistics from Indio High School, who had a, a similar tracking. And Indio High School is a high school down in Southern California. They have a free and reduced, a free, free lunch, free and reduced lunch rate of 88 percent, and they have a 98 percent Hispanic. And so this is a this is a high school that statistically could be very challenged. And you can see what happened with their AP testing, that's advanced placement testing. It went from the single digits up to 32 percent of their students do go into AP courses and go through the AP testing. For a high school like that, it's amazing. You can see what their graduation rate went. It, it gained 10% increase in graduation rates. They've been listed in the best, among the best high schools in the country in the US News and World Report. And this, is a, this was a high risk up until 10 and 15 years ago. And again, it was the magic of another principal who was the principal for 24 years who stood up and said, I make the commitment to do this. But that's hard to find. It's relational. It's building relationships and very hard to find. In 2012, we launched the higher, higher ed division of academic innovations because uh, colleges came to us and said, this is great for high school freshmen, but we have a lot of college freshmen who come in and don't have this background. And what research is basically showing is students who enter college the first semester 
career committed and career focused are twice as likely to graduate as those that come in just because I'm a good student, I'm going to wander through the maze of education, I'm not going to know what I'm, what I'm going to take, and I have no clue what I'm going to do when I graduate. And still too many students graduate from college not knowing what they're going to do. They've got a great measure, etc. Um, today this hybrid course is now used in the state of California. Uh, for dual enrollment on the campuses of many of our high schools. So many of our high schools actually use the college version on the high school, and that helped to basically um, focus those, those, school, those high schools in getting the students college and career ready. In October 2010, I attended an EdTech, MIT EdTech uh, panel discussion, and Linda Weidman of lynda.com was on that panelist, and panel, and when I walked out of that meeting, I said, oh my goodness, after hearing her comments, I said, I know what we need to do, and we've got the platform to get it done. And we since developed what we call the skills-based education plan. We all know what the standard SEP, Student Education Plan for College is, and that is you choose a major, you take the courses of the major, and you graduate. But do you graduate ready for the workforce? Do you graduate with the skills of the workforce? So because the students have gone through this comprehensive guidance process, they have now the opportunity to develop in that process what's called the skills-based education plan. And the skills-based education plan looks something like this. It, that's the online version of it. In the first column, you'll see a list of skills. In this case, this was a student who wanted to be a dentist. How did they find those skills? They go on the US Department of, of Labor website, uh, careeronestop.org. I'm sure many of you have used this. They look up dentist. They find the skills that are, are necessary to get a career in that. That's the first column. The second column, though, is the magic column. The magic column is my plan for learning. And yes, you can get some of these skills in standard post-secondary courses, college courses, but a lot you can't. You have to learn to find your own learning. You have to learn how to use YouTube, if it's YouTube, or read the best book on the topic, or, or whatever. So we're teaching students how to do that. And then the transferable skills process is another process that's important. You get the skill, well, you know, what if that, what if that job goes out of, you know, what if we don't have it anymore 10 years from now, which is happening so much? What does that mean? How do, how do we do that? So we're, cha we're changing the awareness of young people on getting these skills, which is vital to our success. Then in the winter of 2012 is when Get Focused, Stay Focused, which there's examples over there, was born. And this was born with the advancement of realizing that, yes, they can do this process in the freshman year, but research showed if they didn't touch those, skill, those, those plans every year, then I, it, it wasn't going to have the same sort of impact going forward and the same sort of results. And so now all the of those modules in the 10th, 11th, and 12th grade, everyone opens and closes with updating their tenure plan, among all the other things that they're learning to do about what it takes to be successful and economically self-sufficient as an adult. And so in 2014, Get Focused, Stay Focused moved out of the umbrella of Santa Barbara City College and became a nonprofit. And I have one of our board members here, and oh, two of our board members here, Carl Lindros, who's right there. Carl has been a mentor of mine for 45 years, so he ha he's here to support what we're doing. And then also Don Obar, who's the president of Get Focused, Stay Focused. And if you're interested in hearing anything more about it, we're looking for people who really want to get involved with this because it's, very, it's a very important process. It's taken off so much that it's sometimes I say it's the tail wagging the dog. It's very exciting because Today, we have grown from those four high schools we talked about to 450 high schools in the state of California, serving 162,000 students this past year alone. And that was because it's right time, right place, had the research, had the background of a, of a curriculum that was well known and received. We've received that, uh, what's, clear, what's works clearinghouse, um, what do you call it? Check, yeah, what, we're a clearinghouse, we got a big award from that, so, so we have what it takes. But going to scale, we, we've been able to go to scale because of all the partnerships, and that was, that was important. So we get focused in the 8th, 9th, and 9th grade, they stay focused in the 10th, 11th, and 12th grade, but the real magic happens here. This is the real magic. 
in the Get Focused, Stay Focused model, those 10-year plans, which are now online, finally, they're online, they've been online now for 10 years, are used for what we call advising and academic coaching. And I'm going to show you an example of what that looks like. This is a, a, a teacher, he's in, you're going to, he's in Nashville, Tennessee, and he's working with a student who's having trouble with geometry. And, you know, if you went in and you were having trouble with geometry, you're going to get the standard, oh, you need it for college, you need to do this, that, and the other thing. But he, this is the way that this model works. Oh, sorry, before I go, they go online, and they, this is a, a photograph of the sum, summary page that, that that advisor is looking at. And when they state their problem as it relates to the student's dreams, goals, and hopes, and articulates a 10-year plan, there's a whole different reality. You're only getting a snippet. You can go online and you can see the whole video of this. The portion that we're looking at right now are your, your passions and values. And um, I see that you have, was one of your passions is working on cars. Yes, sir. And I noticed in your book it said that you wanted to be an automobile engineer. Is that, is that still true? Yes, sir. Right. So you know that geometry, which is the class you're having trouble with, that, that plays a big role in, in engineering. Yeah. I right? Know. Yeah. Okay. So instead of, so now we're talking about as it relates to their plans, so they, this young man has spent like, I think in that school, 180 hours working through that plan. So he's pretty invested in that plan. He has a vision of where he can go, and they then work through a process of how he can bring that grade back up. And it, it has paid off and, and been a very good, important way of doing it. Okay, and then in 2017, we launched the app. And so the app is that S curve that you see there that takes you, that takes the students through the process that they're learning of how to make these, these, um, these decisions. And that is basically what that is. It's, it, and it, you click on the little things, and, and the, what I call the mother program that they're doing feeds into that app all those that bits of information so they can share that with their advisor, they can share it with their best friends, they can impress their girlfriend, they can do all sorts of things. I got a plan, and I'm going to be good, and I'm going to make it in the, in the future. We also have used, use it for buy-in, because buy-in is a big part of what you have to do. Time's up. Okay, so we're there. Changing attitudes, changing lives, that's what we're all about. And I just want to leave you with one thought. Today, 40% of young people are returning home after college to live at home. Okay? And in Great Britain, they're known as kippers, K-I-P-P-E-R-S. So that's how you get buy-in from parents. Thank you very much. <laughs> my name is George Thomas. Uh, I'm the developer of uh, LearnX. At least this is my latest uh, uh, innovation. Uh, and I'm going to start this presentation very quickly with uh, a very easy raise your hands question. How many of you heard the term lifelong learning? Right. Everybody talks about it. Everybody claims it's important. But here's the hard question. Where? Can you store all of your learning records lifelong in one place in a standard format that you, your parents, your employers, your potential employers can see all of it instantaneously? Doesn't exist, does it? Until now. Okay? That's what LearnX is. So I'm giving you like the, the punchline right off the bat. Okay? I'm going <clears> to <throat> go into uh, where it was developed uh, essentially. Uh, I've been developing uh, higher ed uh, technology systems. Uh, in fact, uh, there are probably about 600 colleges and universities around the world, including most of the California community colleges. And in fact, uh, all of the California public higher ed systems use some of my former products. This is the, the latest one. This is one that uh, I received a uh, two-year R&D contract uh, from uh, the Department of Defense. Uh, and uh, the first year we spent with the Navy, second year we spent with the Army, and uh, uh, it wasn't called LearnX then, it was called MILCRED, for, for military micro-credentialing. And what they wanted is they wanted uh, one place where they could find, navigate all of a given uh, recruits, and then as they go on, soldiers or sailors, uh, learning records, even if they weren't from the military. In other words, if they took classes online from uh, Coursera, if they went to a university and got a master's, if they went to lynda.com, if they belonged to a drone club or whatever, they wanted all those records. And believe me, you have not seen records for learning until you've been in the military. This is the mission. 
So we want a portable, universal platform that aggregates and manages personal, lifelong learning history for individuals. And uh, it doesn't have to be for expediting job acquisition and placement, but that is a key element. Okay, so uh, if you have very detailed records, it's easier to find how to match your skills, your learning history with particular jobs. And I might add, everybody's done resumes, right? At least those of you that are adults, and maybe some of you that are in college and, and starting to do internships and so on. We want to get rid of this. And what LearnX does is it replaces it with this. And I don't mean just uh, like a PDF copy of your transcripts or whatever. I mean something that you can fit onto one page of this smartphone and you can navigate your entire learning history from that one page. Think of Google Earth, but for your learning records. As you see something uh, on the uh, graphic gets displayed, it's interactive, you click it and you can dive deeper and deeper and deeper into it. So that's what LearnX is. Here's the conceptual model. It's really important that you understand what I was after uh, in designing this thing. Uh, and uh, so I'm interested in the whole spectrum. I'm not just talking about your high school records and your college records, you know, the transcripts from those organizations or your work records that you put into a, a resume. I want all of this subordinate detail. So for uh, your uh, K-12, your uh, uh, college work, Typically, you just see a degree and you see the courses under there. So you get only the top two lines. Same for your profession. You get uh, the jobs that you had, you have maybe a few snippets of information about each of those jobs, et cetera. I want more. And I've designed a system that will allow the entities that issue those records, think of a transcript on steroids. If you have academic degree, it consists of courses. Those have lesson modules, okay? Those lesson modules develop competencies and skills, I want all of that, okay? And I've designed a system that can handle all of it and show it and allow you to dive deeper and deeper and deeper into it. This is the model, we call it the LearnX ecosystem. And so the premise is that someday, uh, colleges, the military, uh, various employers will uh, give you access to your records, you're gonna give us permission to take those records, give you a certificate for each of the elements in it, and also store it for, on your behalf and with your permission in a single uh, database that's accessible from anywhere in the world via your smartphone. And this is the future of resumes. This is our design model. It's called a radial tree map. And with this particular design, essentially one of the things the military wanted is everything on one page, hundreds of records, thousands of records. It can be done. We're doing it, and in fact, as you click on each of these elements, you can get deeper and deeper into the subordinate detail. This is what it looks like. I also am nut about designing things that are cool and that younger people especially will think is cool. So the idea is if you have a picture or an avatar that you want to represent you, just like Instagram or whatever, pop it in there, okay? You don't have to, but you can. And then uh, the way this works is that each of these rings, think of tree rings, okay, uh, represents uh, something. Uh, the first ring represents the entities that gave you your records. So it could be the army, could be your high school, could be uh, a particular employer, whatever. And then all of the contiguous arcs around those rings represent the, the descending order of the uh, various uh, awards that you got, whether it's a course, uh, successfully completed, or it could be skills in the next layer, okay? And maybe sub-elements of those skills below that, okay? All of it is possible, they're linked, and you can actually follow them and view them. In addition, you can attach artifacts. So literally, think of portfolios. A lot of you in, in college now are using portfolios. For a given course, you can attach all your uh, examples of your work, whether they're papers, uh, drawings, whatever it might be to that. You can also attach videos, okay? So if you want to show your proficiency in a language, for example, why not show you giving a presentation in French or Spanish or whatever? Much better than just saying, yes, I got a B in my Spanish course. Let's hear what you sound like when you're speaking Spanish, okay? 
Uh, now, what's the purpose of having that level of detail? Something that goes way beyond what's on a typical transcript, uh, a report card, what have you. The purpose is that someday, uh, somebody is going to want to match uh, what you're capable of doing with all of your skills to a particular job that needs somebody with your particular set of skills. And what we did in the project, this was required by the military, uh, we actually connected with a major database called the Credential Engine. Some of you may have heard of it if you're educators. This is a national repository of major standard credentials that are being uh, stored now in a national database. Also, the U.S. Uh, Chamber of Commerce is storing a national jobs database. Think of monster.com or careerbuilder.com on steroids. Literally every job with its requirements will someday be in a database. Okay, so what we did, and we uh, did this as a proof of concept, is we took a given individual's uh, LearnX profile, which as you remember looks like this, it has all that level of detail, and we compared it to the registered uh, requirements of these particular credentials, like retail management certificate, project management certificate, et cetera. And from that, we actually did a very detailed analysis that found that this particular individual had a 63% match and that uh, you could in fact click on to see the details. What do they match or not match? It looks like this. So for example, the skills gaps are indicated by those uh, particular requirements where it noted that you're not qualified for that. If you are qualified for it, here's the evidence in your profile that has that. If you're not qualified, it also gives you hot links to where you can go to get that, okay? And so, I'm going to finish ahead of time, in fact. Uh, so this is the, uh, the end result that uh, we're looking for. We're actually talking with some very large corporations, Salesforce being one, IBM being another. Uh, and that is, if you have a job that's very well defined, in this case, aviation structural mechanic, this is what the, the military was uh, highlighting as one of the ones that are key to its uh, people leaving the uh, military. And you have candidates over here, okay? So we have a LearnX profile for a job and all of the detailed job requirements. And we have LearnX profiles for these six individuals. And now the idea is which one matches most closely to this one, okay? In fact, uh, here's the future. I uh, noticed that uh, Christy asked us, what do you see in the future? In the future, you're not going to go looking for jobs. The jobs are going to come looking for you, okay? What I mean is, if you have this kind of, somebody called it learning DNA, okay? That's exactly what this is. If you have this kind of learning DNA in a repository that you've consented to have your learning profile in, uh, and employers, uh, you give a permission to certain employers to come look for you, they're going to say, I've got this job available. Tell me all these people in the database that might match my job. And they'll get a rank list of who are the top candidates right off the bat like that. Okay? That's my presentation. Okay? Thank you. Um, hello. Uh, I'm Jim Hurley, CEO and founder of Lesson Planet. And just first of all, it's, it's really an honor to be here. I really appreciate being invited. Uh, thank you, Christy. Um, I've come to these MIT forums for many years, and it's, a, it's such a wonderful thing for our community, um, but also a wonderful forum for learning and sharing. Um, so what I want to talk about a little bit is, is uh, how I got interested in education and technology and teaching, um, and then how I started Lesson Planet, and then we're going to go into some of the features and, and the solutions of, of Lesson Planet and our Solution Learning Explorer. Um, and so, um, but first I wanted to start out with a little bit about how I got into teaching. Um, when I was a kid, my mom was a fifth grade teacher. And she had a huge influence on me. She, she loved teaching. Uh, you know, I just saw her enjoy it so much. She worked really hard. She was always looking for great resources. She was always looking to try and inspire her, her kids, take it to the next level. So. Um, I think that was a lot of it for me, and I, when I got into college, I, 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 you know, thought about teaching right away. So, um, let me see if I can use this technology. So, um, I want to explain this slide a little bit. 
So I grew up in Santa Clara, which, uh, as many of you may know, is, is basically become Silicon Valley now. Uh, it's kind of a good place to be born. I, I kind of think that the, the water in California, it, it, there's just something about it. And there's just a lot of innovation, a lot of entrepreneurship just in the water around here. Uh, we're very lucky that way. Um, and, uh, but I went to a school, it, wasn't a, it was kind of a lot like what you see on the left up there. Uh, you know, baby boom time, there I had 40-something kids in my class. I don't know how the, the, the nuns at St. Clair's did it. Um, it was very much command and control. Um, not a lot of personalized learning going on here. Not a lot of technology, maybe a chalk and a chalkboard. Uh, so it, it, this, it, that was reality. And I know some classrooms are still like this, um, but there's a lot of classrooms that are not. And I think what's very, very exciting about ed tech is w the innovation and the creativity and the in amazing ways that teachers are, are using technology as a tool, not a panacea but a tool, and when used well and in moderation uh, and creatively, can be really, really effective. Um, so, made it through high school, enjoyed that actually very much, but was really becoming interested in technology. And the same year I graduated from high school was the same year that these uh, techie, hippie uh, geniuses, uh, you probably recognize Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak from Apple, in inventing the Apple IIe. And that was the year it came out, the first real viable, marketable, very successful personal computer. So they really kind of invented the personal computer market. Um, and it was right down the street in Cupertino. That was back when Silicon Valley was Santa Clara Valley and had orchards between us and Cupertino. Um, in 84, uh, uh, the Apple Macintosh, an amazing machine, came out. And uh, I was just like, just couldn't believe it. It was so cool. Uh, in fact, I was getting my master's, my, my, my credential, uh, teaching credential at Santa Barbara Junior High in 1985, and I just read about the Mac, but I had never seen one, and all of a sudden the librarian walked in with a, my first Mac that I ever saw, and I was just in love. And it's just so cool. It had graphical user interface, mouse, you know, icons, drop-down menus. You could tell this was going to change education and empower teachers and learners in, in a whole new way, and that it was going to blow the socks off, and this was going to be a huge industry. Um, and it was good timing for, for, for me. Um, I at, started, uh, found out that UCSB was just starting a new ed tech focus in the ed psych program uh, uh, there, and was able to get my master's in, in ed, sec and ed, ed, ed tech, and had the chance to start teaching uh, I taught special ed for a while, then started teaching um, at UCSB, teaching teachers how to integrate technology uh, effectively into the curriculum. And uh, in the middle of that, in 1995, uh, all of a sudden, this out of the blue, this World Wide Web came on the scene when, when some 22-year-old at, at University of Chicago during a summer hacked out the first web browser, Mark Anderson, okay? and he gave it away for free on the internet, and all of a sudden, it just took off. All of a sudden, you had images and linking, and you know, all of a sudden, all those solo computers were starting to really connect to each other, and in a meaningful, easy-to-use way. There was nowhere to go in the beginning, but eventually, pretty quickly, I was suddenly, instead of teaching teachers about you know, Carmen Sandiego and all these different software programs, I was also now teaching them and showing them look what's out there on this new web thing. It's really cool. Um, I remember the guy at the microcomputer lab, I, I first showed him when, the, when Mosaic, the very first web browser, came out. I said, this is so cool. And he looked at it and went, ah, there's nowhere to go on that web thing. It's not going to come out to anything. I was like, yeah. Anyway, by 1999, uh, I was um, starting to aggregate a lot of the lesson plans that teachers were creating. and. Um, which the final project was a kind of ed tech centric lesson plan. And so we had about three or 400 lesson plans on the UCSB site. And I, I just kind of as a side project, I've been thinking about starting an ed tech company. I put together educationplanet.com and back in the Wayback Machine doesn't, is unforgiving. Uh, and this is, you can find everything on the Wayback Machine. But basically back in October of 1999, within a couple months, we'd won a couple of awards, one from AOL and one from Netscape. So anyway, changed the name to Lesson Planet in 2002 because we noticed it was a lot of teachers coming there. And um, 
And so let me tell you a little bit more about Lesson Planet. Um, our mission is to, we have a great, amazing team of teachers and, and engineers and marketing folks, and we're committed to creating and delivering innovative tools and resources to help personalize student learning and inspire great teaching. And I think great teaching is really key because you need to have teachers who are really inspiring in order, and with really great curriculum in order to t solve a whole myriad of problems. Okay, you can inspire, you know, kids that are really challenged, they're gonna still got a lot of problems, but if you have really cool, exciting, fun curriculum that's compelling and relevant and meaningful, you can solve a lot of problems. So, uh, Lesson Planet, we have two main solutions really quickly. Our B2C solution is direct to teachers and parents, and we've been doing that for a long time. We have a whole team of teachers that go out and find and vet and curate and review uh, what we call open educational resources, uh, free, high-quality resources from all kinds of different sources like Khan Academy or NASA or Smithsonian. There are literally thousands of sources and millions and millions of OER out there which is a real windfall for educators if they can find really good ones. So think of it in a way kind of like Rotten Tomatoes is for movies. We're kind of Rotten Tomatoes for curriculum. We help educators find quality educational resources quickly that are curated. Uh, on the right side is our B2B solution, which we're very excited about. We've been wanting to get, break into schools and districts. Um, and uh, our new solution is called Learning Explorer. And it basically is a learning object repository and curriculum management platform. And um, basically, uh, it helps to, with our, what we call a personalized learning curriculum cycle, where you can discover, design, deliver, assess, and adapt. And right now, we're working with our strategic partner at Cobb County School District in Atlanta, uh, over 10,500 teachers there. And we're starting to work with a number of other districts as well. It's very exciting. Um, this is some of the feedback we're starting to get from the teachers at Cobb County. Um, and let me just show you a little bit about the, uh, the solution, because I know we don't have too much time. So um, let me just point out, this is the search area of, of Learning Explorer. But right in here, it's hard to see it, but this is what we call the providers box. So what you have here is, is top open educational resource providers, uh, as well as top educational publishers. So integrated in one giant federated integrated search is everything from, you know, uh, well, Lesson Planet curated resources, but also Houghton Mifflin, McGraw-Hill, Discovery Ed, Newzella, some really great uh, providers that we're starting to partner with and get more and more content in there. So if a district subscribes and licenses content, they can, we can do our best to try and work with that publisher to get it into this learning object repository, okay? And then you can filter on the left and um, you can drag and drop very easily in, into what we call the collection builder on the right. So you can teach us, people, teachers actually call it fun. Like, this is fun. So then you just find resources, you check them out, you, you read about them, if you like it, you start building a unique personalized assignments, personalized collections and you can build your whole set of courses in the learning, uh, what we call the curriculum manager area, where you can start to turn your lessons into units and your units into courses, and then you can uh, ultimately assign them to students using what we call the collection player, and this is what the student would experience. Uh, it's bit of, a bit like a web-based PowerPoint with lots of different resources from all over the web. Teachers can upload URLs, they can bring in resources, not just be stuck with what Houghton Mifflin offers, but you can mix and match from many, many different publishers and many, many different free open educational resources. Free or fee, a teacher ought to be able to find it and create meaning and personalize it for those students. Um, it's available also, it shows up really nicely in, on, on your smartphones and your iPads. Um, we're excited about a couple of partnerships and, and then I'll wrap up here. Uh, one is with an assessment company called Education Insights. And uh, we're working with them when a student takes, say, a formative assessment and they're having trouble with a certain concept and they aren't, aren't, aren't failing at it, they don't, they're not mastering it, a teacher can create a collection that'll show up right then, as soon as they finish the test, and they get this remediation or these enrichment resources that help the student go, oh, okay, condensation. I don't, I'm, I'm not understanding that part of water cycle, 
let me go take, watch these videos and experience this collection and then take the test again. Um, we're also working with a local ed tech company, uh, Parent Square. I don't know if any of you know them. They're really, really wonderful. And uh, we're integrating with them for, with, for Cobb County. And so the parents will also have access to a similar library of open educational resources. And, the, and teachers can also push resources out to them. So that, that's kind of it in a nutshell. That's what we're working on. Thank you. So I thought I'd kick things off with a few questions to our panel and then we'll open it up for Q&A from the audience. So start thinking about what you wanna ask. Hopefully my questions are somewhat representative of some of the things you might ask yourself. So panelists, my first question, where are some of the biggest opportunities for ed tech startups today? Now you've touched on, on a few things in your presentations, but perhaps we can delve into them in a little more depth. In other words, what are the unfilled needs that um, ed tech entrepreneurs and investors in the room should focus on, in your opinion? I'll jump in. Right? Okay. <laughs> um, I, th I think one of the areas, in fact, uh, I think uh, Jim's company is a good example, uh, repositories. Uh, the fact that uh, storage is so inexpensive now, the fact that so many uh, learning resources are uh, being made available uh, on an open source basis. Uh, people who figure out what is it that people would like to share uh, and have access to a great many of whatever this is. So in your case, Jim, it's uh, the lesson plan uh, content objects, which are great for teachers who want to piece together elements of a course. In our case, we're starting a repository of learners and their entire learning history. Uh, we're also dealing with very, very large employers, federal government, uh, Fortune 500 companies who want to offer jobs to all of these learners. Uh, and so that's another example of repositories that can be easily accessed to find a lot of uh, good common information. So I think uh, that's one area that certainly is uh, getting a lot of attention and uh, a lot of investment money as well. And I would say what we do is a repository in a sense with that 10-year planning process because, again, they can now start carrying it around in their pocket and they can keep it with them. Yeah, I think um, some of the areas that are pretty hot in our world is differentiated instruction or think of it as uh, personalized learning. And so what are some vehicles that can drive personalized learning? Uh, AI is one of those, artificial intelligence. So that market is, uh, we're, we're anticipating that's gonna explode in a big way. Another uh, market that uh, is really gaining a lot of momentum is the special needs market. So if you have content or you're thinking about delivering and developing great, amazing, cool, life-changing stuff for kiddos that really need it, you know, that whole special ed uh, niche is really, really a, um, a great market to serve. Just uh, following up on that, Brian is, I, I know some companies that are in the ed tech space and, and uh, absolutely, I mean, the wonderful thing about special ed is there's a lot of funding. So if you're thinking of, you know, of starting a startup and you have a connection to special ed for some reason and you really feel like you have a solution, uh, it's, it's a good market if you can really reach the decision makers because there is good funding and that's always, that's a good thing. Um, there's a couple other things I was thinking about. There's a great book that Steve Case, who uh, was the founder of AOL, has written a really good book called The Third Wave. And he talks about how the internet really is in its third wave right now. The first wave was really AOL and, and you, know, uh, you know, the early servers, you know, Citrix, uh, you know, the, uh, not Citrix, uh, uh, um, what's the, networking server company. Cisco. Cisco, Cisco <laughs> all the wiring, the early days of, of the world getting wired. And then the second wave was really, you know, search engines and social media and apps, right? And that's kind of where we're still in that, but we're kind of leaving the third wave is the harder stuff. The, the markets that really haven't been tackled, they aren't easy. You can't just come out with a WhatsApp app and, you know, be worth $18 billion. It's harder. But those markets, education, you know, the, the healthcare, agriculture, energy, law, you know, areas that are kind of slower, more bureaucratic, 
you know, and, and, and decision making is oftentimes uh, fragmented, like you were talking about. Um, those are the ones that, that are, are, are the, their needs are not completely filled yet, but as entrepreneurs, there's huge opportunity there. And I think in the education space, I see opportunity all over the place. Um, and, and I think, you know, it's like you said, the budgets are just getting growing, growing. We have a huge population, we have you know, almost 8 billion humans. There's a heck of a lot of learners. We're all learners. We're all, it's lifelong learning now. We need to reskill. We need to upskill. As automation comes, you know, we have a huge, huge challenge as educators. This is exciting. Um, and what, we're going to use technology as a tool to try and help that and augment that. So I think there's lots of areas. Some of the notes I had was uh, STEAM, STEM, you know, technology. Uh, you know, there's a huge shortage of technical skills, engineering, software programming, um, you know, great organizations like code.org that are helping with that. But there's, you know, great opportunity, huge need for, you know, a lot of teachers aren't programmers, let's face it. So there's a, there's a gap there. And so there, a lot of schools still don't really inspire kids to, to fall in love with, with technology and, and with programming. And, and yet, there's a huge shortage. Uh, and, and programmers get paid insane amounts of money um, because of that shortage, okay? It's a huge challenge. Um, language learning, as you mentioned, VIP kids, and, and, and not necessarily just in the United States, but all over the world. Uh, it's exploding. There's a great solution here today. Uh, Shunya is a really innovative language learning solution. A uh, lot, of, lot of opportunity there. Uh, 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 social emotional learning, um, you know, Digital literacy, media literacy, these are all really, really important areas that I think that, you know, are, there's an un, unfilled need there. So tons of room for innovative entrepreneurs. Christy, I want to make one more comment. I mentioned artificial intelligence. Uh, I want to give you one example of uh, where that's going in, in higher education in particular. And it's a project that I mentioned earlier, our association with Salesforce. Uh, they're currently involved in a project with uh, Arizona State University, which is uh, really one of the great research universities in the country and very innovative president, President Crow. Uh, they're looking at their entire admissions process uh, and partnering with uh, Foothill De Anza uh, Community College District up in Northern California, a very innovative uh, uh, community college uh, district, uh, but also some high schools. Uh, because what they're looking at is the entire admissions, transfer, credit, and placement uh, process, which is uh, very labor intensive. Yeah. You know, we ta I talked about earlier about uh, uh, comparing curriculum, comparing results on a transcript, et cetera. It's done, passes through many, many hands, and lots of paper gets reproduced and, and looked at, et cetera. Uh, well, the reason I'm mentioning this is because the project that they've started with Salesforce and some very high-powered AI-based uh, service companies is to see to what extent uh, the uh, use of blockchain technology, which will have, uh, you know, very, very detailed, granular uh, information like ours, in fact, that's why they're talking to us, uh, uh, can be assessed and interpreted by an AI engine, and as, as uh, uh, implausible as this may sound, their long-term objective is to basically have a front-end uh, admissions evaluation uh, and transfer credit uh, uh, assignment, or at least recommendation, uh, done by AI. So, uh, you know, someday it's going to be like checking into a hotel. <laughs> you know, and you you, you, you want to. Uh, you're going to send them your, your blockchain records, hopefully through LearnX, uh, and uh, the AI engine will uh, evaluate it and uh, immediately give the counselors uh, and the admissions people a recommendation like that, okay? As opposed to, we'll get back to you in two weeks after we've evaluated your transcripts and so on. So, uh, you know, this isn't fantasy anymore, it's real. Uh, and I wanted to give you at least a sample of a project I know of firsthand that uh, is showing where the artificial intelligence capabilities are going. Uh, it may take them another 10, 15 years, but they're uh, determined. <laughs> they're, they're working on it. Well, we're doing it right now in early literacy. Yeah. Today, thousands of classrooms in America are using AI to teach 
first graders how to read. Yeah, yeah it's pretty cool. Yeah. So are they like a private tutor in a sense? Would you say that's how it works? Um, no, it's uh, essentially using the methodology to mm -hmm. individualize instruction, mm -hmm. right, for wherever that mm -hmm. beginning reader is. Mm -hmm. So using the algorithms that it can point to skills need and development right. and then pointing to a lot of open source uh, mm -hmm. content that the teachers can use to build the skills. Right. My granddaughter, who's five, is using one of those. She goes to Summerland um, Elementary School. And so my daughter said, Mom, go in there and take a look and work with her and see how that works. And I was very impressed because I have a little bit of a resistance about AI actually in the classroom. And I was really excited to see what it could do for her. And as you said, you know, if she made a mistake, it kind of coached her, and so it was a somewhat of a private tutor. My only caveat on that is then about a month and a half later, I went in with her to continue that process because, you know, she works through level one, level two, level three, level four, and she's very competitive. Um, but she was a little more resistant. And so I just want to caution that we don't take the instructor and the human relationship out of this AI process. Because I was trying to analyze, you know, why are we now not so excited about doing this? And what she wanted was the human reinforcement. And so that's, a, that's just a one-time thing, but I think with AI we have to be careful in actual instruction. Yes, use it in management, as you're talking about over here, using it with it. But when we're working with children, let's not take away the opportunity to think and the relationship of that teacher. And that's... My, that's what I've observed, even with our schools. No, okay. no, I, I know with, with us, when we're, we're definitely dabbling with AI right now, and, and you know, at, both on the recommendation side of resources uh, and also on the curation side. And um, you know, at the same time, we're big believers in the role of the teacher and the, the teacher take on it. So when you know, we, have these, we have all this curation, but it's really what's critical is the teachers talk about you know, what, what are the classroom considerations? What are the pros and cons? What, what would they do? What do they like about it? Mm -hmm. Giving that teacher that, that, so I think the, the perfect combination is a hybrid mm -hmm. kind of AI assisted uh, with slash human teacher and, you know, experienced person input. So we have yeah. to build that. Yeah. We have to build that and build the support systems and everything else. I yeah. just want to be cautious yeah. of that. Okay, so I think I'm gonna hold off on my other two prepared questions. Being that it's 7.30, I really want to hear from the audience. So we have two roving mics. Um, put your hand up if you have a, if you have a question. So my question was, we hear a lot about these mass technological disruptions that are ahead. And I was wondering just, what do you think that the classroom of 2030, for instance, is going to look like? Well, yeah, I mean, you know, gosh, uh, that, that's a huge, huge question. I, I think it's kind of a, a, you know, all of the above. Um, we're going to see massive influence of, you know, robots and AI, and we're going to see more peer-to-peer -peer interactions, more people helping each other, um, and, and, and we'll still see more kind of business as usual with the colleges, um, perhaps. But uh, increasingly, I, I think technology is just going to, get faster and cheaper and it, you know cloud based computing is amazing you know ai and machine learning is amazing uh, you know and so i think it's a combination of all of those i think we need to be careful about some of the giant players uh, dominating we're already seeing that with the kind of fang you know facebook apple amazon network netscape uh, google uh, those giant uh, and kind of semi monopolies uh, taking over uh, to a certain extent, and and uh, and, and you know, we just got to keep an eye on that. Uh, hopefully, maybe we can roll back some and get some more regulation on on that. But I think uh, it's going to be pretty exciting. Hang on, because uh, as you guys know, you, you know, young folks, you know, we all have supercomputers in our pockets now. Mm -hmm. um, and if mm -hmm. anything, it's about it's about balancing that with real life and the outdoors and <laughs> nature and moderation. What, what I hope happens is it really makes personalized learning for young people so they can create their own curriculum. 
I mean, I go back to when I was going to college, UC Santa Cruz was just starting, and, and you, it was this college or university that you could create your own major, in a sense. Um, and it, it kind of worked. I had a friend who went through it and stuff. But today, it really gets down to helping young people become economically self-sufficient, helping them get, have the skills that they need to be able to compete in today's job market. That's a big ethos of what I believe education is. And, and we're starting to move in that direction. You know, if you're le reading the, the Chronicle of Higher Education and everything, everybody's starting to realize that. The 2008 recession was a major game changer. Major game changer. Because if you think about it, in 2008, all of a sudden we had dumped into the marketplace highly qualified people who could compete in the marketplace. They had the skills, and they just happened to work for a company that couldn't make it. And so the students coming out of college at that time had a really hard time getting jobs. And we still have the graying of our workforce because people are, are economically insecure. They don't have enough retirement. And so as students come out of college, they are having to compete. And they better have the skills. Because as employers, what do we hire from? We don't hire for degrees anymore. We hire on skills. And so I'm hoping that this will help young people figure out the, what they want to be early figure out the skills they need to take, get that training, if they do it in a classroom or if they do it by watching YouTubes, whatever. They get the training, they, become, they master their skills, and they are competitive. That's what I hope for the classroom of the future. And it will be classrooms that maybe look like something very different than today. You'll have traditional classrooms. You need that high-tech, high-touch, going back to megatrends of 1980 in today's world, but it also is going to put the power in the students' hands to get what they need. That's what I hope. <laughs> so uh, Kristen mentioned uh, some statistics about the labor market and job vacancies and the seals gap, and Mindy was talking about just now a transformation in the labor market with the 2008 recession where employers began to experience a market in which they could sit back and screen resumes and be very selective. And I'm wondering if anyone looking ahead sees a change in that labor market where something called on-the-job training that was a common buzzword 30 years ago comes back and where, unlike the main markets that you guys all talked about in K-12 education and higher education, uh, you also see large employers labor unions, professional associations of teachers, accountants, computer programmers, being the places that are putting together curriculum and seeing it as their role to be uh, leaders in continuing education for the labor force. One of, one of the books I would recommend you read is Thomas Friedman's Thanks for Being Late, Chapter 8. Chapter 8 is all about education. And if you get a chance to Google on YouTube or whatever, look at his presentation on this topic. And he talks about AT&T. And AT&T now basically has an ethos and a, and a strategy that every year the AT&T determines what they need for the skills to continue to move ahead in their industry. And they go out to their each of their employees and they say, you know, you have these skills, and now you need to get those skills. And they create their own, uh, with audacity, their own curriculums to get those skills. And, the, and they'll pay for their, their ability to get those skills, but they have to do it on their own time. They don't do it on company time. And if they say, up, oh, I've, you know, as he says in one of his lectures, I've called, called up too many phone calls, I don't want to do it again. He said, they basically give them a great severance package and a great out but you have to be a lifelong learner. They, and so the companies themselves are getting very aggressive. And as he says at the end of his presentation, you can be assured this is coming to a, a, an, an industry near you. So if you get a chance, read that book. It's, it's pretty, he's very good futurist thinking. We all know that from you know, the books he's read. And so it's where it's going. Yeah, for sure. And then when you look at all the, new play, the newer players in the past decade, you know, in the corporate training or continuing education, you know, look at the, peop the people softs of the world. I mean, that entire industry is just blown up. And as a matter of fact, a lot of those, a lot of those people are trying to enter into K-12 and higher ed now. 
you know, the, the traditional kind of corporate um, software developers that turned into HR companies that turned into whether it's Paycoms or PeopleSoft, a lot of those, their next kind of frontier is getting into the traditional education system. So it'll be interesting to see how that plays out. Yeah, I mean, I, I, you know, I just think, I look at the cost of a traditional four-year college and it's just completely insane. It's completely different from when I was at UCSB, uh, which was virtually free. Uh, and so the old days of being able to just take whatever you want, nice liberal arts education, which I'm a big fan of, that's a real luxury, unfortunately, at the insane prices that, that it is now. So something's got to give. The, some of those smaller four-year colleges that aren't so great, they're going to have a lot, big problem. They've got to reduce their prices. The brand names can get away with this insane pricing. They always will. But everybody else is going to suffer as these other solutions start coming in. Exactly what George and Mindy are talking about. It, and what I'd love to see is, in addition, even at the four-year colleges at UCSB, it should be much, there should be two tracks. One is, hey, I'm a communications major or whatever, you know. And the other one is, I've got this plan for, of, for getting a job. I'm actually interning and I'm developing some skills and I know exactly, I, I know what I'm doing. Talk to your average junior or senior at UCSB, they've never done anything what, like what Mindy's talking about. It's, and I, I worry about that. So, you know, I, I think the job market is, is tough out there and it's changing and with automation coming, you better keep developing new skills. Now, one, one follow-up comment I'd like to make is I see uh, the corporate clients we're talking to uh, developing partnerships with uh, educational institutions uh, and also going very, very big into uh, guided pathways. Okay, I, I know that's a big movement in education, but I got to tell you, it's really huge in the corporate space. The idea is you want your workforce to continue to evolve and get upgraded in their skills. And they're literally constructing, if you will, programs, as they're called in higher ed, with set courses that are uh, that can be taken either from internal uh, resources, and by the way, they do have something called their own universities. Right. So there is an AT&T university uh, that trains a lot of their people. But also, uh, uh, they'll give you like options to uh, take courses outside uh, the uh, organization uh, and uh, online in various sorts. So they'll give you like literally a program. Here's a set series of courses and learning experiences. You finish this, you're now ready for this uh, next higher level position. Okay. Uh, so I see that as being very big. Uh, and and uh, in fact, in, in our case, since I showed it to you, we've uh, uh, factored that into the design of LearnX. You can literally register a pathway. So you can say, here is the set of things I'm already taking, but I want to take, uh, for example, uh, this set of uh, uh, guided pathway courses and experiences that will lead me to become, uh, let's say, an engineer someday. Okay? And it might include internships as part of the pathway that you have. And you can literally track it. You can see it in our uh, ring tree model uh, as uh, identified colors that show this, this is a uh, pathway that you're on. And as you achieve each of these, the colors change. And so you're tracking your pathways as well as your existing uh, coursework. Okay? Yeah. The challenge, I think, is bringing this understanding of these, this availability and this requirement down to a very low age. And we're talking elementary school, junior high school, high school, so that these school students develop the attitude and the experience so they know how to take advantage of these things. Sure, our top 25 to 30 percent students in relationship to academic achievement are going to be able to take advantage of it. The challenge is, is to get all students to be able to understand the need for this and take advantage of it. And that's kind of been the mission of Get Focused, Stay Focused, and, and what we do. And so it's bringing that down so they can take advantage of these wonderful things coming at them. They have the attitude and the, I can do it. I can do that. Um, I just wanted to say, first of all, I appreciate all the, the work that you're doing. I think it's a really exciting area and kind of you know, almost like a, a, a new wild west of, of education where it's going and uh, you're trailblazing it. Um, but I, I know that education also has a history of really great initiatives um, 
and new movements that oftentimes end up having a lot of unintended consequences. And I've heard hints of you talking about the ethical things, you know, the relational transactions that are so important for kids in a classroom. Um, you know, when I, when I think of um, what you had up on the slide, George, there with the, the, the aeronautical engineer, I thought that was a really elegant illustration of, you know, from an employer standpoint, everything that's needed, and it kind of captured everything that you'd have to have to do that. Um, but another side of it saw something akin to a, a supermodel that is so hard to attain, you know, potentially, or could unintentionally unintended consequences lead to parents of really young kids trying to get all those boxes checked as so many options are available. Who's leading or how are you guys amongst yourselves having these conversations or is there anything organizing or self-organizing to lead an ethical conversation around something so important as education? If, if you can repeat that last part. <laughs> yeah, the, the question was is there any way that amongst yourselves as these, these leaders in these areas, are you self-organizing or is there somebody leading a conversation or a set of ethical standards by which new uh, ideas can be measured against because this is education after all we're talking about. There are some very large efforts uh, and processes going on right now to define standards, like how do you uh, define the requirements for a job as opposed to just some narrative paragraphs, right? Uh, the same goes for credentials. So, so uh, I mentioned the uh, U.S. Chamber of Commerce Foundation. Uh, there's a project called the T3 uh, Foundation, and they're literally constructing very precise standards for how uh, companies of various sizes should describe what a job uh, classification requires. Okay. Uh, and I think it's going to be very significant for being able to do, first of all, they're, they're going to put them in a repository, so this goes back to our uh, whole idea that repository is going to be large. They'll have standards, in, uh, entities will deposit their job requirements in there, and you're going to be able to uh, put your uh, learning profile in another repository, and then either yourself go seeing how well you match up, you can do that, you'll be able to do that, or uh, the bots will come looking for you, as I said. Uh, it's going to happen, okay? B basically, I, I talked to a senior VP at AT&T, another one of our clients, uh, who said, uh, George, is there any way we could s see the learning profiles of students in progress? Okay, we don't want to wait till they come to a job fair. Mm -hmm. okay, is there any way we can see, hey, how are they doing sophomore year, uh, junior year, et cetera? And uh, that's an interesting issue. Uh, privacy issues, obviously. I'm not, uh, you know... Uh, lessening the potential issues regarding privacy, but if you're interested in a job, a really good one, and you say, all right, uh, I'm going to put it out there, I'm going to put my records out there, let's see who comes calling, okay? They, they, they really want to see the progression of your learning uh, before you come to a job fair table and you're looking at their materials and looking for a job today. They, they'd like to uh, scout, if you will, and uh, find out. Uh, that's going to happen too. You're going to have early scouting for those people that voluntarily, uh, you know, put their records into these databases. You know, and if you don't have a super focused track that you already know about at a young age, uh, Department of Ed, you know, has the Common Core uh, standards. They have the 21st century skills that teachers try to teach for the information age. Let me just read a few of them here critical thinking, creativity, collaboration, communication, information literacy, media literacy, technology literacy, flexibility, leadership, initiative, productivity, social skills. We don't know exactly what jobs there are even going to be in the future. Um, and so as a base, everybody needs to try and have develop these skills so there's flexibility as the information age evolves. Uh, and that's really the goal of the 21st century skills that are out there. And I think it lends itself to a lot of the project-based learning, the personalized learning that we've, we've heard a lot about, the lifelong learning. Uh, if you can have kids doing real projects, working in groups, figuring it, problem solving, doing inquiry, building drones and seeing if they could fly, I mean, make it fun, make it meaningful, and make it hands-on and collaborative, but project-based. And there's whole school districts that are focused on project-based learning and personalized learning. It's exciting. 
Hello. Thank you very much for your uh, presentation today. I love the diversity of topics. Asking this next question kind of from the perspective of an employer. Um, I was going to actually ask about a little bit about bias in these um, uh, platforms that are going to in the future go and select, but I think it was adequately addressed or touched on on the ethics discussion there. So maybe the next topic would be, I think all each of you right now are in a job that probably doesn't fit a traditional description or the, doesn't answer the question that you would ask a child, like what do you want to do when you grow up? So how are you thinking of um, maybe kind of diversifying the types of career paths that are out there? Um, and I come from that perspective of if I were to look at the titles at the roles within our technology company, there might only be actually a small handful in a very small department that map to kind of traditional definitions of um, jobs and careers. And so how do you capture the richness of the possibility that's out there for career paths um, that don't sort of fit, you know, financial advisor or uh, a technician's kind of role, for example? I'll, I'll jump to that one first because uh, I, I did not want to give the impression that only systematic, orderly pathways are the only thing that you should store in your lifelong learning. Let's say you have several alternative paths, like you want to be a rock and roll drummer, okay? Uh, go ahead and, and start uh, storing some evidence of that, even if it's self-asserted. That's another thing we offer. Not just that it's coming from an official source, but if you want to state, I have this skill and it's based on this evidence, like, for example, you're going to do a YouTube video of you uh, playing drums, okay? That's evidence. That's an artifact, okay? So uh, uh, I, I think that, uh, you know, what we're trying to capture is, yes, let's support the very orderly corporate, academic, uh, and military needs for very precise guided pathways and learning programs, right? But uh, this is a lifelong learning uh, tool. Let's also capture what this individual is thinking of doing uh, that has been suggested to him. And by the way, there now are sites where people who are uh, mentors, if, if you will, who've been through a lot of life experience, they're now suggesting alternative pathways different from what academic institutions uh, give you. And so whether it's uh, something like that from an uh, online uh, mentor uh, you know, uh, site, uh, or something you just say, okay, I'm going to put down three things I want to do in the next three years. Go ahead. And then uh, present some evidence. I assure you there's some HR person out there who will say, this is really interesting. Okay? We'd like to bring this person in to talk to them, even though they may not match up on the more traditional, quote, standards. Okay? As a product request, I would say, is there a good way to catalog um, what their values are? Sure. There definitely is. Uh, I, again, I, I'm not intending this to be a Learnix <laughs> tutorial, but uh, we, we anticipated that too. Uh, the design is such that you can append and create links for pretty much anything you want. Uh, you know, if, if it's a list of values that you have, sure, go ahead, put that on there, okay, that, and follow it in the, you know, the Learnix uh, tree ring. And, and the more we know about your learning styles, for instance, that can be factored in. Um, I think for employers, you know, jobs are going to change, job titles are going to change. Ten years from now, half the jobs at your company aren't going to be called that title, probably. Uh, and, but, if it, but really, I think at that point, uh, employers are looking for initiative. I know the number one thing I look for is initiative. Do you have, do you have, are you innovative? Yeah. Are you creative? Yeah. Do you think outside the box? You're going to come saying, hey, I was thinking we might want to, I love that, right? So. We need to teach that in kids. And the way you do that, I think, is creative projects, hands-on problem solving, real world meaningful yeah. uh, activities and, and curriculum that's inspiring. Hi, Paula Kasten here. Um, thank you very much. I wanted to ask you, we've talked about the importance of lifelong learning, uh, the 21st century skills that everybody needs, and then um, just you were talking, Mindy, about just how important it is that they have skills that are valuable in the workplace and they're ready to go into the workplace and think beyond their degree. 
How much, I wanted to ask Brian, Brian, how much of the ed tech industry is actually addressing those things? Because I'm, such a huge portion of it is addressing operational stuff, administrative stuff, showing me as a parent 24 seven, the grades my kids have, A through G standards, like that, that we have so much in public education, so much infrastructure. We have 100 years of history. It's, an, it's not an, in, it's really hard to innovate in public education. How much, I think schools have different incentives, like their, their whole incentives are not necessarily to create lifelong learners, right? They're, they want grades or kids into, into college, that's all they care about in high school, getting into college, that's the only number they seem to care about. So do you have any comments on that? Like, is our system structured and is ed tech helping to achieve these goals? I just see massive impediments. Tough question, <laughs> great question. Um, you know, looking at it from the activity, you know, in terms of uh, the continuing, the uh, career and technical readiness, right? Um, there, there's more investment dollars going into those types of companies. That was actually one of the areas that um, I didn't get a chance to speak up when Christy asked, you know, what are some other kind of emerging hot markets? Um, that segment is really hard, uh, really hot as well, right? Because there is, there's so much ambiguity about am I ready? Do I have the technical skills um, to go and be a new, a, a non-traditional kind of role, right? If you wanna be a graphic designer coming out, right? There's a pretty defined career path. Um, but if you wanna go out and be a blogger and play the drums at night, and you know, work at Starbucks in the morning, and then you're writing you know, books for ghostwriter for famous authors, right? You have these multiple things that you're doing. How do you get ready for that? that that's a good question. Yeah, I think one of the things that, uh, again, if you look at the US Department of Labor websites, is this issue of helping young people understand what transferable skills are. If you saw that rubric that I showed very briefly, um, about the skills-based education plan, and this person wanted to be a dentist, but they also wanted to be two other positions, and they could see that skill really transfers yeah. to this, into this, into this, into this, so if they wanted to have three different jobs at once, they could, but again, it's a functionality of helping young people understand what even a transferable skill is. It's a functionality of understanding what those opportunities are, and what we developed, you know, for a long time it was, let's all get everybody graduating from high school. And then it was, okay, let's uh, get everybody graduating high school and going into college and or post-secondary successful. Now it's, let's get them going into college and let's get them completing because we have so many um, percent, high percentage of students who don't complete college. And by the way, research is showing, if you start college and not complete, it's harder for you to get a job than if you never went to college because employers look at that and say, why did you quit? Uh-oh, you know, this is a problem. But what's really important is going beyond. And this is what, like, we had a student at Carpinteria High School in one of our videos say, what I've learned, it's not just about going to college. It's not just about getting in college. It's about what you do after college. And so helping young people have that long-range thinking beginning at a very young age, in this case, the 10-year plan, is one strategy for trying to address that sort of a issue. It is. <laughs> right, right. Well, that's inherent and it's very 
And, yeah. and that's why the humanities are very important. And what we have to do is help our, in, our English instructors, our philosophy instructors, be able to articulate what are the skills you are learning in this class. And if I could wave the magic wand of education, every class, and let's just say post-secondary, every post-secondary class would have the list of skills, and they aren't hard skills. They, aren't not con they are not all content skills. It might be, in this class, you are gonna learn interrelational because we're gonna do a lot of dialoguing, a lot of, of different things. So those skills are broader. Go on the Department of Labor again, skills, they go into all those skills as well. I mean, you're gonna, they're gonna come up, and we just have to be able to appreciate them and figure out ways to help students just, learn that they need just, them. Just one more thing yeah. on that. I think well, maybe what you were talking about too is the testing paradigm yeah. that we're under now, which is very kind of punitive. After the fact, you get labeled, you got a D or whatever. After, it's too late. You know, if you had formative assessment, if you had authentic assessment, as you're going and your goal is to help you master it and not punish you and label you, I think that would be a really different paradigm. And I think that's, that would really help. And there are schools that do that. Alrighty, as we are rolling into the eight o'clock hour, uh, it's time to wrap up. And I have to say that even though this was a relatively low tech evening, I learned a lot <laughs> about education. And I hope you all did too. And uh, let's thank our speakers. They were really great. Thank you.